All right, three after the hour. Why don't we go and get started? We'll catch up with people later. Small group today. Um, let's see, AIs. I know Rachel said she hasn't had a chance to do hers yet, so we'll skip that. Community time. Are there any issues from the community at large that people would like to bring up? All right, moving forward. Uh, we have not had an SDK meeting. Um, I don't think there's anything there for to mention. At least I can't think of anything going on too exciting with the SDKs. I, actually, I guess I should mention one thing. We have a lot of activity going on in the Golang SDK. And I think I may occasionally see a couple of uh, comments on one of the other SDKs. And honestly, I can't remember which one. It may be the Java one. But a fair number of the SDKs seem relatively quiet. And that kind of concerns me a little. So if you're part of an organization or just you personally are working on one of the SDKs or have an interest in it. Um, try to make sure that there's stuff going on there because I'm pretty sure most of them are behind the specification. I think the only one that's probably most up to date is the Golang one. Clement, I don't know where the C-sharp one is, but I just see most activity going on the Golang one and that worries me relative to the other ones because they all seem very, very quiet. And that leads me to think that they may be behind the spec itself. Now, I'm, I think I'm a little bit behind, um, also because we didn't, we're kind of in the inter version stage, so it's kind of difficult to label the new stuff with something. Right. Um, but, uh, um, so that's, that's, that's my reason for it. Like, I, ha I have no discriminator effectively for the new stuff. Like, I could call it 0 0.2 bis or something, but, you know. Yeah, and that's fine. I think um, the only reason it's kind of interesting to me is because at one point in time, we did talk about possibly doing some sort of interop demo at KubeCon EU. And, I, and we recently decided not to do it, mainly because of the low activity we see going on in the SDKs, that, because then we assumed people wouldn't necessarily have time to, to fix up the SDKs uh, in such a short period of time. And so it, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point. So I decided to put it out there for people to be aware of uh, People are making decisions based upon the lack of activity. So, okay. all right, yep. Uh, moving forward then, uh, let's see, for the next demo. We have had some phone calls um, to discuss where we are with that. I won't go into the details here other than to say I think we are making really good progress. We have a fairly well-defined scenario. It, it is around the airport one that we talked about in the past. We are gonna steal the time after this phone call um, to continue some discussions if you guys can make it. I know it's a last minute decision. Um, uh, the, the hour after this call was originally meant to discuss KubeCon EU planning, but we don't really have a whole lot of topics there, so we're going to steal that time. Um, uh, we, we do have a dashboard that's coming together rel relatively nicely. I don't think I'm going to be able to show it during that meeting after this one, but hopefully later today I will have something up on SourceDog for you guys to take a look at so you can see how it's progressing and then you guys can make suggestions. But anyway, keep an eye out for those things going on. Um, uh, I know Scott's not on the call, but Doug, is there anything you wanted to mention relative to the uh, scenario doc since you were the big driving force behind the current version of it? Um, Doug, if you're talking, <clears throat> can, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, I took a lot of the uh, the information and tables that we. Had I had been presenting in in a slide deck, and I uh, consolidated all of that into a Word document that I was hopeful that um, uh, Scott could help uh, convert that back to a a Google Doc for uh, collaborative comments. I yeah, was I'll try trying to get to everything into one source to to for to facilitate further discussion. Yeah, I think Scott is out today and tomorrow, so I'll try to take that doc that you sent us and, and incorporate into the Google Doc. Just give me, give me a little bit, uh, like a day to make that happen. Okay. Cool. All right. Any questions on the demo stuff? All right, moving forward. KubeCon EU, as I said, we have a scheduled meeting right after this one, but don't have any topics, so it might be very, very short. Um, I don't think there's anything much to mention there. Nothing's really changed. Um, the, the Serverless Practitioners Summit, the CFP closed last week, I think, or something like that. Um, they're still going through reviews of those. And so if you did submit something, I uh, expect a notification, I believe, within about a, about a week or so. Uh, we did not have too many proposals actually submitted, so I suspect most of them probably will get accepted, just to let you guys know. But we'll have to see how it plays out. 
Uh, let's see, KuCon is China, nothing really going on there. All right, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we get to the meat of the meeting. Um, next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, Mark and I were invited to join the CNCF end user forum uh, feedback call, which is basically just an opportunity for the end user community to talk to different working groups um, within the CNCF or different projects within the CNCF about their, about their project and ask questions in both directions, actually. And so we're scheduled to go, uh, as I said, next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. There is a link to the agenda doc. If you don't have access to that, uh, let me know and I'll see if I can get you access to it. Basically, the reason I'm putting it here is so that you guys can see the list of questions or what we're going to actually talk about. So uh, you should be able to see on the screen right now. I was basically just going to provide a quick overview of the serverless working group as well as the cloud events uh, project and then lead into the questions that we had for them. Basically just finding out what they're doing with, with functions and serverless and stuff like that, what their pain points are, those kind of things. If there are questions that you guys would like to have us add to that list, if you don't have access to this doc, just drop us a note and we'll add it to it and we'll let you guys know the outcome of the meeting and share these minutes if you're not allowed to actually see the doc. Okay, any questions on that? All right, moving forward then. Um, let's see, V3. Okay, so at one point in time, um, different people have mentioned the possibility, and I, myself included, of possibly getting to 0 0.3 in time for KubeCon EU. Um, I do believe it's still technically possible. We may have to speed things up a little, but in terms of the roadmap that we have listed for 0 0.3, um, I think we're making, some, I actually pasted it here into the doc. I think we're making some really good progress on the optional attributes. I think we're slowly getting those behind us. Security related ones, I believe um, we've actually addressed the one security issue that I think Gem opened up or PR that Gem opened up. Um, I'm not actually aware of any security related issues um, in our backlog. So if you think I'm missing one or if you'd like to raise one to get added to the list, please do it sooner rather than later so we can try to make sure we address those in time. Um, the biggest one is probably this one right here just because it's a lot of text. But I do think we are with addressing. Respect, oh, with sorry, respect, go ahead. With respect to security, um, we basically said we're assuming trusted middleware, right? I believe there's a, either a PR for that or it went in already. I, I don't. I, I can't remember where we are with that, but there's someone mentioned something along those lines. Yes. Okay. I, I think it was uh, recommend encrypting the data field and just have all everything else plain text and trust the middleware. Yeah, and now I think that was Jem's PR that went in recently that addressed that, I believe. So, so Evan, you, you may want to take a look at Jem's PR that was merged recently and make sure it addresses uh, your comment. I'm pretty sure it does. Um, but as I said, if, you, if there are other security-related issues, please open up those sooner rather than later so we could try to address those. Um, relative to practical use issues, I know that we have the, the size limit one I don't believe anybody's really done much with the other ones out there. So if those are of interest to you, please open up issues so we can start those discussions. Otherwise, we may just assume that uh, there is no concerns known at this particular time and we can cross those off the list as being done. I think we've talked a little bit about uniqueness constraints on event ID. That's part of an open discussion right now, yes. And so. fields being immutable as well, is that part of that discussion? That wasn't part of that immediate discussion, no. Um, okay. I, I think, I'm trying to remember, I, maybe Klaus is working on a PR around the possibility of immutable fields. I'm not 100% sure. But I don't think it's on the call to, to, to answer that. Um, I think at least some guidance there about event IDs and how those relate um, for like caching and deduplication would be useful. Right, so I do have, do, 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 uh, item in the agenda today to talk about those four attributes, ID, source, subject, and type, and how they relate, how they relate to one another and the uniqueness, uniqueness checks around them. I don't think we're going to have time to necessarily do a deep dive discussion about it, but I want to point people to the document that we're supposed to have the discussion around that. So I think that will address most of those things you mentioned, Evan. Um, but some of the other things, if you don't think they're covered someplace um, and there's no issue for it, just open it up. Or if there is an issue and you think I've, ign I've ignored it by mistake, ping me and I'll make sure it gets added to the agenda. All right. Okay, anything else related to the V3 road roadmap? All right, moving forward. 
Um, May 7th, we are going to have our yearly status slash review with the CNCF TOC. Um, I have not started working on the presentation for that yet. I will get that started fairly soon, and when I do, I'll make that available for you guys to review and comment on. Any and all review would be very much appreciated. Um, it, someone mentioned the possibility of us going to incubator around the same time. I checked the, the uh, graduation criteria to go to incubator, and I think this little bit of text right here is probably the biggest hurdle for us, which is documenting that we have at least three independent end users. Now, I have an open issue to the TOC to, to define what end user means in our particular case, right? So, for example, does that actually mean cloud provider or is it a user of a cloud provider? I'm going to try to get some clarity around that. Um, but the reason I'm mentioning it here is because, one, I'd like you guys to think about whether you would feel comfortable with us going forward if we did meet this criteria as a group. And then, two, if we, are, want, if we, if we do want to go forward, um, be thinking about whether you can put forward uh, someone to fit this bit of criteria about three independent users once we get a clear definition. So for example, if you personally know of a customer using cloud events, find out whether, you, whether you're allowed to mention them by name. Um, if you are a cloud provider using cloud events in some way, find out if you're allowed to mention that publicly. Those, those kind of things is just do a little bit of investigation on your side so that when we get clarity on what independent user actually means, or independent end user actually means, then we'll be able to ask for uh, names to help justify that or prove it. Okay? So I said, I didn't want to necessarily discuss it here, just want to bring it up for people's attention to think about. All right, before we jump into the PRs, are there any other high level topics people would like to bring up that I may have forgotten to mention? All right, let's jump into PRs then. All right, so this PR, oops, hold on, things are getting in my way. All right, so this PR has been out there for a very long time. Um, James, I believe is his name, James Roper. Uh, he wanted to add an event key to our spec, um, mainly for transports like Kafka more than anything else. We went back and forth quite a bit on here. And where we ended up was, rather than adding a partitioning type of uh, property to the main spec itself, we're defining an extension. And we decided to make it so that um, the definition that what he originally proposed actually hasn't changed. It's still used for defining a, a casual relationship or for doing some sort of grouping of events. The biggest thing that's changed recently um, is this section right here. I hope, uh, let me unhighlight that so you guys can actually read it. This, this sentence that's, start, that's highlighted a little. The biggest point here is that this property actually can change if the event travels through multiple hops because I believe, Clemens, you were very concerned about the fact that it, it may be impossible or it may, the business logic at each hop may actually change the buckets for categorization purposes. Yeah. And, and so this allows for that to actually happen. So uh, I believe this text has been out there for at least several days now. I'll give you guys a chance to actually just look it over. It's relatively short and it is just an extension. So the bar is lower than a normal spec change, but I'll give you guys a second just to look at this. I have a question on this. It said it, it, it said it's grouping between multiple events. Are these events the same? Uh, I mean, this multiple instances of the same events? No, or I don't. Separate event? No, I believe this. I believe the intent is separate events that may have some sort of relationship in terms of the bucket in which they'll be placed into at the destination. So, for example, uh, I believe. Uh, helping to classify what queue they may go into at the destination. Do I have that right, Clemens? Is, is just one example. Um, can you say that sentence again? Kathy was asking about this phrase, multiple events, and about whether it's the same event replayed or whether it's completely independent events. And I'm saying it's independent events. Yes. And the relationship that we're doing here is for, as an example, to figure out which queue to put an event into when it reaches its final destination. Yeah, there's, there's, there's typically some level of correlation between those events uh, because um, partitioning is, is, is creating buckets that are then easy to process from. Um, basically, you have a torrent of events that, that comes in on one side and then you want to go and pre-partition it so it's easy to go and process them. So there's an implied, implied relationship between those events, like the same origin, et cetera. 
so that you um, uh, are able to then process them in context and that in that infrastructure where they landed, they are in about the right order. Yeah. So, so within a partition key value, you would expect events to be ordered and between partition keys, there's no such guarantee. Uh, yes, that's typically how it's used. And then the, 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 uh, the further discussion, just to summarize the, 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 what Doug, the point that Doug was made, uh, made about how this might change. If you have two of these infrastructures behind each other, like let's say you have a Kafka and then there's another Kafka uh, that's following that where you have kind of pre-partitioning for of that torrent of events for uh, an initial set of process stage of processing and then you uh, route those events further then all of those events would have the same partition key which means they would all land in the same partition in the downstream kafka um, and that's not what you want you want to have some some reasonably even distributions which means you have to go and figure out a different partition key and a different criterion to go and distribute them fairly across those downstream partitions Did that help answer your question, Kathy? Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, because um, quite some time ago, we discussed the correlation of events, right? And so I think this is a, a kind of like, um, there's some overlap there. Um, so this is specific to the partition. I'm just thinking, you know, for the correlation of, you know, different events for different uh, use cases, there will be other, you know, um, other keys or other um, identifiers. So yeah. I'm just wondering why we specifically find this one and not the others. So, so think of this, the precision of partition keys as to be as good as north, south, east, west. They, they don't give you, they give you the general direction of where you want to throw an event, like the, the broad, but these partitions typically take events from very, very many different contexts so that you can go and and and, pro, and process them in parallel so if you the the use case for this is like kafka or event hubs where you get a torrent of events that's, that's coming on one end and then you have a hundred different vm a hundred vms which in parallel pull the data out each for its partition and go and work through it but each partition will then have you know 1500 2000 i don't know how many different contexts that that processor still needs to deal with. That's kind of, so the, it's fairly coarse as a, as a, a correlation mechanism. What, what matters is that each stream is labeled in a way that it lands in that partition so that, that in the end, everything that is coming from that particular, whatever origin or context that's labeled with a partition key shows up in, that, in the, the time of arrival order in that stream and gets pulled out in time of arrival order uh, in that stream from that partition. But that's about the only separation that you get. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether this is specific to the streaming cases, case or it could be, uh, um, because if we talk about correlation, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, and we discussed before, there are many um, different scenarios that would need um, correlation of events and um, uh, you know we had we even had meetings discussing this so I'm just wondering you know are we going to define you know each one for some category of use case for each category of use cases or how we're going to um, proceed with this you can if you want to you can use this obviously to be uh, a um, a core, like partition is a general, very general term. So if you want your partition to be, because you've been using these, um, the building management use cases, right? If, you're, if your use case, if your partition is a building, that's fine. So if you, if, if you in a particular scenario say, all of the devices that are sitting in a building are using the building uh, ID as the correlation key, or sorry, as the partition key, and then that's how you run those into the system. And then your backend infrastructure is uh, effectively creating distinct streams on a per building basis, partitions, then you probably have the correlation that you want. So you can use this key um, to create that correlation. And, and, and I don't think the, uh, the, um, the language that we have here speaks against that. It's defining a casual relationship grouping between multiple events. 
And so you can certainly, for the use case that you described, what, half a year ago or a little bit longer, um, you can certainly use that field. Mm. So I, I'm just thinking, you know, if we want to, if we would like to make this uh, very generic, um, probably we should call it correlation key. Um, but if we, if we would like this to be just, you know, the partition to a stream, then we can call it partition key, and then we might need to define other keys for other use cases. And also the description, I think it would be better to add, you know, clarification on this maybe give some examples how we are going to use this. Otherwise, uh, I feel it's not very clear. I know this in, in the extension, but still for people to um, correctly use it, it would be good you know, to add more clarification. Or we, we need to decide whether we would like to make this very generic or, or specific to a category of use cases. Okay, I'll, I'll Clemens, wait before you speak up. I think um, Tapini has, oh, has his hand up. Yeah. I mean, Clemens can answer if he wants. Oh, on, on the naming issue, I will choose to stay neutral because I am too old to get into naming discussions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so what I wanted to ask was, um, I'm not going to let you answer again. That's your answer. But, uh, is this, we were talking about semantic versus, I don't know, functional uh, keys. So the use case for this was actually splitting the stream or using this as the key in, for example, Kafka, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not the semantic key or subject because I think the subject field is a semantic version of this, uh, which we were talking about last week. Yeah. And, but this would also be, so, so how do I put this? Um, th this is intended to change between middleware, right? much like the um, pulling the value out of the payload, as you suggested in some earlier call comments. Yes, so the, the reason why I was arguing against making this core part of the spec and initially also argued for this being element of the transport, um, but I'm okay with this being an extension, is that ultimately the consumption strategy for, these, for the events is dictating what the partitioning model needs to be. So ultimately, the partition key is something that the, the, you choose based on the needs of the consumer. It's not necessarily something that the publisher, um, when they initially create the event, will know about. But there's a further step. And that's, I, th I believe that further step is really when you hand off the event, the produced event to the transport infrastructure that you then go and figure out how you construct from the given metadata that's already there how you construct a partition key to sort of satisfy the needs of um, the, the partitioning model that you chose for consumption. And then once you, and then for these multi-stage processing models, when you um, are effectively pre-partitioning a stream using Kafka into let's say 16 partitions, and then you pull on one of those partitions, but you further want to go and subdivide that stream for processing then you will probably go and pick up those events and then you will choose and they will all effectively have the same sets of keys. At least they will all ha they will hash the same way. So they will, they would, they would naturally land in the same partition. If you happen to have a situation where you have like 16 partitions here and then downstream you have another 16 partitions. And if they all landed in partition one, they are, again are going to land in partition one, which means you now need to go and change your strategy in terms of how you create that partition key so that you get easy, even distribution downstream. So yeah, this will change. Um, and it's, it's really driven by the consumption model rather than the publishing model. So the publisher itself, the, the core generator of the event will not necessarily know, but it's adapter effectively to the downstream infrastructure will know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that, that's, thanks for the clarification, just because I think the subject being the semantic key and this being the functional partitioning key, I think these are like core missing pieces from the spec at the moment. So I am very happy about this. But uh, to put the Cadiz point, um, yeah, I mean, correlation is a really big bite to take. So I wouldn't make this generic exactly because of the, because this has a well-defined use as being a partition key and you want it to change. You don't want it to be some random correlation uh, string because you want to change it every, uh, like many times. So. I think this is great as a partition key and not as a correlation key. 
I don't see anybody's hand up, so let me just speak in here. Uh, Clemens, I think the description you just gave about how, you know, the, oh, I can't, darn, I can't remember the exact words you used, but it sounded really nice where you're talking about how something like source is really meant from for the producer's point of view in terms of, you know, this is telling you sort of like where it's coming from kind of stuff or subject, whereas this is really more for consumption by the receiver to figure out what they're supposed to do with it. I can't remember the exact words you use, but would it be mm -hmm. possible for you to rephrase that, the text, we could put that in here? Because I think that distinction in terms of the, the role this thing's supposed to play would really help clarify why this isn't necessarily meant to be a generic correlation ID per, you know, type of property. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I call this cons consensus strategy, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because the uh, way you phrased it was really good and, and, and it really resonated with me. Sometimes it happens, um, but I cannot always remember. Um, well, it is recorded. That's true. So I have to go listen to myself. Um, <laughs> I will. Um, yeah, I'll I'll go in and add that. I, I just made a note. And uh, yeah, I will I will go in and try to kind of add that in here as a, okay. as a amendment. Okay, that'd be great. And and I guess uh, I think. Whether that text actually goes into here or the primer, because typically specifications are relatively concise. So this may be better text for the primer. That way, you know, we can ramble a little to make it perfectly clear. And just think about then it, where it goes. Then I'll do that for the, then I'll do that for the primer. I, I still owe, uh, except that one snippet that I, that I wrote, kind of the overview, architecture overview piece, which we still haven't merged, by the way. Yeah. Um, um, I, I wanted to do some more work on the primer, and so I can probably go and, and take that as a as a primer element. Okay. Um, is there a description about the partition key? Like for the extension? What do you mean? Like you're, you're, you're on line nine. Can you show us the top of the document? Doug? Yeah. Can you not see the document right now? No, I'm asking if you can go to line one. You're oh, on line, line nine. I'm, I'm sorry. Line yeah, line so, so that right. description at the at the start, I would expect that to kind of explain that what it is to be used for. Oh, that's a good point. I forgot this is an extension. So it may not be good right. for the primer. You're right. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, OK. Yeah. I'll, I'll okay. figure out the magic way of how to amend these, um, because that's not my proposal, I think. Yeah, you, you, know, you can just put a comment in there, and then James can pick it up if he likes it. Yes. OK. Okay. Christian has if Christian has had figured out a way to go in and add stuff into the commit. That yeah, that's a, that's a GitHub thing. Yeah. yeah, and and I don't even know where that feature exists. Like I have. Um, you you can suggest there's a suggest an edit button somewhere when you do a review. That's where you, you can do something. If you start a comment, so yeah. Doug could probably show this. Um, up at the top, there's a plus minus icon at the top of that little box. Hold on. I'm pointing at my screen like anybody else can see it. Uh, next to the font thing. <laughs> next to the font thing. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, no. yes. So that suggests a one line edit. It can only do one line edit. It can't do larger things. But if you type a suggestion here, it suggests instead of, in this case, the empty line, put this other text. So, but what's interesting is, Clemens, you ran into a situation where that will get sort of merged in and the person's commit, or the, the commit will be associated with this second person, but they haven't signed it. Yeah, exactly. They haven't signed it and then, and then your own signature gets picked up. So, so if I then accept it, um, my, I, it's, it gets signed by me, but co-authored by. But, so it's, it's a different signing uh, in the begin to, to start with, but the person who made the suggestion, their said signature isn't in it. Yeah, so it might be better to stick with just GitHub comments for right now until we can figure okay. out how to do signing. Great. Okay, but I guess what I'm the net, the net of this, in my opinion, is it's too early to to merge this one. Clemens, you have an AI to make some text changes. Kathy, it sounds like you wanted to do some thinking about some possible suggestions as well. So. People take this one offline, make some suggestions, and let's see if we can get this one resolved relatively quickly. Because as I said, this one has been out there for a very long time. And I feel kind of bad for the authors of this, um, for, it, for it lingering so long, even though it's been a good discussion. We need to get this behind us. And I know that other people are waiting for it outside of this PR. In particular, the Kafka transport is really waiting for this one. So they're blocked on this one as well. So we really need to get this one unblocked as soon as we can. 
Okay. Any other questions or comments on this one before we move on to the next one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, like, okay, there's some background noise. I'm not sure who's has people talking in the background. Oh, sorry, I forgot to. Read. Yep, not a problem. Thanks, Evan. All right, moving forward. All right, Heng Du, I believe, is the gentleman's name. All right, so given our previous agreement for proprietary spec references, this PR adds a reference to the Rocket MQ uh, transport binding. So it just replaces our placeholder with the reference. And I did check that URL is good. So this one's relatively easy, and it's the first one we have. Any comments or questions on this? Any objection to adopting this PR or merging it? Cool. Thank you guys very much. All right, Clemens. I don't believe you made any changes to this one. So I think this one is ready to go, but I did have a question for you. Where is it? Uh, not here. Um, Evan made a comment talking about a constraint section. And I want to make sure that this stuff down here in your mind covers Evan's comment. Uh, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure because the, the comment didn't go away. That's why I just want to make sure it wasn't lingering. Okay, so in that case, let me just close this. And did you want to give like a, just a one minute quick overview to refresh people's memory about why we have this one or why it's being proposed? Yes. Uh, it is. Uh, it is proposed because of uh, Alan Conway. <laughs> um, so, so he's been he's been trying to Im implement an intermediary that dealt with cloud events, and he found and that in that included some transcoding of the content, and he found that looking just at data and the content type uh, or data content type, he could not figure out how a non string how some non string content was encoded because he could not tell between whether um, a string that was a base 64 really contained um, you know, a binary or whether he should interpret that as string. Like he, it wasn't clear for him to go and figure this out. Um, and there's, there's precedent for this. So uh, HTTP uh, solves this um, uh, using, um, and then MIME also solves this using uh, the content encoding field. So this is now called data content encoding because it's only related to the data field. And uh, if present, that field as specified uh, holds, really holds the value base64 at this point as specified. You can choose other ones, but you must support base64. And um, then um, you can tell whether the data is effectively binary and you have to go and decode it um, or whether it's, um, it's not. So it's effectively the indicator for how the data field, what the encoding for the data field is. Um, and then the, the data content type tells you what the media type is that you just, that you found there. All right. Any questions for Clemens? All right. Not hearing any. Is there any objection to adopting this PR? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not raising an objection because I'm not sure I have an objection, but I'm also, okay. I'm still reading it. Sorry, I should have read it before. No, that's fine. Go, go ahead. Take your time. I'm going to update my list of people on the call. I guess I don't have any objections. I like, why not have, like, why can't it just be like any type? Like, why is it, it seems a little limited. And I don't know why. We're, we're effectively just picking up prior art. From what? Of RFC two, uh, 2045. Okay, I will click through that and read it. Can, um, all right, I don't want to hold this up. I just need to read a little bit more. Do you want to not approve it? Um, can we consider it at the end of the meeting? 
Okay, we can we can okay we can wait until what? Can I can I just like ignore a conversation for like five minutes and <laughs> go for it? I, I, in, in the meantime, Jude, your hands up. Yeah. Um, so it says when the data must be encoded as a string, you need to have data content type to indicate the indicate the the encoding of that string, right? Yep. So so what about the real content type then? What happens oh. if I decode that? So in the in our structured encoding mode, when we have everything in a JSON, then data is there's no binary option for for data. Like there's no way to represent um, anything but a string, just because that's that's how JSON represents things. So then you're effectively forced it, forced to put something into that string that carries the binary, and that's usually base sixty four, right. but but it might also be it might also be something completely different. Um, so you might use percent encoding or or anything else. Um, you know that's up to you. Um, but it, the the base sixty four is um, uh, um, you know a way to go and put binary there. But we have no way of labeling to tell to tell anybody that the string that you find in data. You really need to go and decode that first with base sixty four, and then the output of that you can look at. Ah, so okay, so the output of that you look at then the content type. Correct. So which is a data content type with I think zero point three, right? P correct. Yes. Okay, perfect. That makes sense. Sorry. Yeah. Yep, that's good. That's a good question. Okay, so tell you what, we'll, we'll circle back around that, give people a chance to read RFC uh, twenty forty five. Um, but I, I guess in the meantime, are there any other high order questions on this one? Okay, so let's just keep moving forward then. Let's talk about the subject. Uh, unfortunately, um, Rachel, you might have had an action item on this one. Because I think last time we talked about subject, you may have had some questions that you were going to raise, but you hadn't had a chance to do your action items. Do you still think you have questions? Mm, on maybe. So the the real action item for me is to read the like prior art because my question about subject is how it's different from the things we talked about before, specifically topic. I think that was what we called it before. Okay. Um, and I failed to read to go back and read all of our prior art on that one, like the conversation we had then. But that was that was the like concern I raised because like we brought up topic before we were like no we don't want to do that. So when subject came up, I was like, well, what has changed? Why do we want to do that now? Okay. How would you like to proceed on that then? Um, is, does every, mm, so I read through this. I read through this PR by itself. I haven't read through the, um, through the like links to the prior art. And this by itself seems okay. Mm -hmm. Does like, I, I feel like does anyone else remember the conversation that we had about topics and like why we why we rejected that originally? I do. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, I think I think the the we the major the major um, disconnect we all had was that topic is a th so it was about topic not so much about subject. Um, and um, I think we were arguing together for subject and, and topic kind of as a, as a as a joint thing. And I think the the hang up on topic was that topic is a um, is a concrete concept in middleware, where people felt bolting this to middleware was inappropriate, and that source was a more appropriate uh, way to express where the event came from. Now, if you go deep down in theory land and uh, you, you know, forget, forget about the existence of software for a moment, then topic as a word per se, um, kind of gives you that abstract uh, uh, grouping of, of events into you know, a shared topic. But I think the holdup was that topic is used in, in um, since it's used so pervasively in middleware, it felt that it was inappropriate to kind of, you know, create that strong association. Yeah, I think, I think of PubSub. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, exactly. And I think, and I think that's that's how we landed at source. Um, and it was it was then with 
um, I think the subject went under with the, with the rejection of the concept of topic. Um, and then we ended up kind of in that, in that discussion we had, we, we said, okay, we should, we should be able to live with that one URI. And now with people starting to implement, I think they feel like the source is a good choice. And, and by the way, now my engineering team also thinks that, that source is a good choice. Um, and um, and that but that the extra um, element here the subject is still is still missing. Okay, the other question I have is how this so there's a conversation about uniqueness and how does this PR relate to uniqueness? I'm not sure it does because a a source a source should. Um, emit uh, distinct events. So I think having the source and the um, ID, th those two things together should be unique because the subject really just points into a inner structure of the source, but I don't think that is something that contributes to the uniqueness of the event per se. I think the, 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 event, the event's identity is scoped to the emitter and that's the source. I'm okay with that answer. Okay. That seems fine with me. Okay, cool. Does anybody else have any questions on this PR? This is the subject PR, just to refresh everybody. And this is for the spec, not an extension. Okay, let me just double check, make sure we've addressed all the comments. I think you addressed Scott's comment. And... I think that was just editorial. <clears throat> um, so I, I have a question on this. Um, yes, Kathy, go ahead. So is this subject, the subject will only apply when the source has a structure, a substructure. So that's when the subject comes into play. Is that the case? Um, yes. Um, I think, and that, I think that's true. If, if you have a very simple, if you have a very simple source, like you have a, sim a single sensor and the sensor just emits one kind of packet, then you don't need to, you can omit, omit the subject. So, um, so, so the subject identifies a field in the substructure, is that? It, so is that let's it? say, let's say a, you have a sensor and the sensor gives you readings about, um, uh, let's say temperatures and um, CO2 levels. Um, you could model it so that you can get distinct events um, for the, the temperature and the CO2 readings. And you can go in and model that on the subject, which means you, you, subscribe, to get to, to, you subscribe to get all the events that the sensor gives you, but you can go and dispatch on the, or filter on the subject and uh, one of the subscribers may only be interested in CO2, and the other subscriber may only be interested in, in temperature readings. Oh, so it is like a, a field to identify, a, the subject identified a field in the substructure. It, it, might, be, field? it might be whatever you like. It might be a, a, a submodule, that it might be anything, um, anything that you can imagine in terms of substructure. It might be as little as a field, might be entire giant piece of software that sits somewhere in an infrastructure that you just subscribe to as a whole. Okay, so it's for the for so it's for convenience of you know to um to decode the um the source information right because the source okay I'm trying to find out how we define the source the source itself I if I remember it let me take a look at this it said it's itself is a is a has its own structure. Let me see. Like syntax data is coded in. Now. So Kathy, I don't know if this helps or not, but I tend to look at this as the subject is the entity on which the event occurred, or the, the, but it's the entity which the event is about, right? So when you create a new blob in a blob store, it is the blob itself. That way you can easily filter to know, oh, I just want to get events about this one particular image that's in the, in, in the data store. 
So exactly, I don't I don't quite understand uh, Clemens's sensor because I don't think any sensor would have a subject because they are so simplistic and the whole information would be in source. But for example, if you think about the first example, is really good in there actually. Like if you have a storage storage container and you get events from that storage container where the source is that storage container, then the subject wouldn't be a part of this uh, the source. It's an auxiliary field that actually identifies the file that right. is being modified in the source. So I think databases, storage containers, and such are better examples than sensors because I don't think this actually applies to them. Yeah, just since Kathy is always using sensors and devices, I just thought I'd pick her up where she is. But it, yeah, is, yeah, also, okay. yeah. But it is also optional. So as Tapina was saying, if, you're, if your environment doesn't have necessarily a subject field, um, then you don't have to include it. Does that help, Kathy? Yeah. So basically, the subject could be any chunk of the any chunk of the source, right? It doesn't need to be a part of the source. If you look at the example, the source is the storage container that holds files, and the subject is the actual file name that is being modified. So it oh. might be something inside the source. This is the point. If you have a database, you have a table. The source is, for example, the database and the table concatenated. The subject might be the ID of the role that was modified, for example. Oh, okay. okay, I see. Yep. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this one? Okay. I think I may have made some comments um, in here, but I think mine are strictly editorial, and I'm okay with looking at those as a separate PR after this. So let me ask the question, do people feel comfortable basically taking a vote on this one? Okay, I'm gonna take silence as consent. If you have any concerns, please raise it. Okay, is there any objection then to approving this PR? All right, thank you Clemens very much. All right, uh, Rachel, circling back around to your data content type or data content encoding. Did you have a chance to look at that referenced? Yeah, RFC? this seems fine. Okay. Thanks for waiting. Yep, not a problem. Okay, so going back to this one, do it, does anybody have any other questions or concerns on this PR? And I know sometimes it may not seem like it, but it is perfectly acceptable to raise your hand and say, I would just like more time. I mean, eventually we will say, Time's up, but if you need more time, don't, don't hesitate to speak up. So any objection to adopting this PR? Okay, cool. Thank you, Clemens, for that one as well. All right, we have Thank nine you. minutes. Yep, nine minutes left. Unfortunately, we don't think we have a whole lot of time to dive deep into something. So what I'd rather do right now is draw people's attention to a couple of key discussions that are going on. In particular, this one about resolving the quote issue. Um, definitely not ready for approval because there's a lot of discussion going on over there, but we need to get this one resolved relatively quickly, uh, definitely before 0 0.3, because this could be a pretty radical change if we change anything at all. So please look at that issue um, and comment on that if you can. <clears throat> and also, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole discussion that needs to happen around the relationship and the semantic meaning behind ID, source, subject, and type. Um, because when we, people started, for example, wanting to be able to add something to the spec that talks about how a receiver can do deduplication. And in order to do that, they have to know which fields uniquely identify the incoming event so they can know when something's been replayed. And I believe right now the spec pushes us towards uh, source and ID in combination being that unique identifier. Some people have advocated that we need to add type to the list. Um, but if we do that, obviously we need agreement from the group, but then I think that also is going to impact the definition of what ID meant, because right now ID is meant to be pretty much that thing you can use to do deduplication, at least from the exact same producer, which is why we wanted to add in source. But if we're going to add in type, then we need to explain what ID actually means, because you may actually have the same ID for two completely different events coming into a receiver. So what I did is I started a document here with the current version of the spec 
and I believe uh, maybe an Allen's PR that tries to link ID and source as the unique identifier um, into that to try to get a discussion going around what these attributes actually mean going forward because we have to resolve these questions. So please take a look at that document. There are some questions in there to get a better feel for what people are thinking around these particular fields. And so please comment on that PR so we can get a discussion going in there. When we feel like we're sort of solidifying around a concrete proposal, we'll bring it back to the group. But I want to have some offline discussions. Yeah, can go ahead, just, Rachel. Can we just flag that subject is definitely not going to be used for uniqueness? And we decided that when we accepted the subject PR? Yes. That is definitely Please, true. yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't think anybody suggested subject be uniqueness or be it's used just, for uniqueness. Yes. It's just like brought up in that document here. So. Yeah, drop it. Oh. Um, okay, I'll double check that, but I'll, I want to make sure I didn't put something in there that talked about how we have to talk about the relationship between them, even though it's not used for uniqueness. Because because that this document isn't just about the uniqueness checks. It's about what is the semantic meaning of all four attributes. But I'll double check and make sure that nothing in the document suggests that anybody wants to use subject for uniqueness. So thank yeah. you. Rachel. Yeah, I think this is a very good, you know, um, very good discussion. I think we, we really need to sort out this, you know, what is the relationship, what's the uniqueness, so that people are, we bring people on the same page. Otherwise, I think, you know, when people just read the document, could be sometimes people might be confused. Yeah, and in fact, Clemens, I don't know if you saw it, I made a comment on your, I think it's your subject uh, PR, where you had an example in there where you actually start talking about the relationship between subject and source, I, I think. And I thought the description there was really, really useful for someone to understand how the various properties work together uh, in, uh, in conjunction with each other. And so I thought it might be useful to take that example and pull it out from under the subject attribute and make it a more higher level a discussion point. Um, but okay. I'll open up, I'll open up a, a, a PR for that. But I thought that would okay. be a good discussion. And I think that does tie into this discussion here. So it may all be linked at some point. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, I don't think we, we have five minutes left, so I don't think we have time to really dive into anything deep. Are there any high level topics people would like to bring up for discussion or just awareness. Okay, in that case, let me quickly get. Um, Can I just ask related to the uniqueness yeah, in, in the current in the current wording of the spec. So I have this problem where um, if you if you um, create two events for the same occurrence with two different types, let's say there are different versions, version one and version two, do they have the same ID or not? In the current spec, I don't mean like after that discussion, it might change, of course. So uh, my reading of the spec is that the ID is meant to be completely unique for every single event from a producer. Okay, so it would be different for the different versions. Okay. okay. That was my interpretation anyway. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, Evan, I know I heard you. Um, Christian, are you there? Yes, hello. Hello. William, are you there? William? Okay, what about Matt? Matt, are you there? Matt? Here. Hello. Klaus? Yes, here. All right, Dan Barker? Here. All right. Um, Matt, are you there? There are William. I think William had a drop. All right, did I miss anybody on the attendance? I'm not sure what this is for. Hold on a minute. I hate it on Zoom. Okay, I think this is just a mistake. Oh, maybe that's Doug M. Okay. All right. In that case, I believe we're done for today. Thank you guys very much. And if you want to hang on, or are you, if you're interested in either the demo or cloud event, I'm sorry, or KubeCon EU discussion that's going to happen on this Zoom channel right after this call in three minutes. Otherwise, you're free to go. Bye, guys. Yeah, thanks for permission. Yep. Okay. No, I just want to really to thank Clemens for the both the explanation of the uh, partitioning key and the subject, because I think those were two huge things missing from the spec.
or an extension. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Yeah, what I like about the, the subject one in particular is, as Rachel mentioned, you know, we had this whole big discussion before, and I think we were getting ourselves sort of mixed up because we're trying to incorporate too many things all at once. And so I like the fact that we sort of landed on a single string, meaning source, and then slowly or maybe pulling it apart as we come up with concrete use cases and clear justification for why it has to be pulled out. And I think it's a much, it's a much more calm and, and easily understood discussion now than it was before. Yes, and now I just realized that I forgot to bring up a point I was ready to bring up to Nicole, but I say now. Um, so the topic versus the subject, the old versus the new, I think the topic one is, that's the part where I was saying that we don't do routing information, but we do do routing information because someone was suggesting to add to the spec this sentence that we don't do routing information mm -hmm. in the context attributes, but we actually do say like specifically that we do routing information. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, go, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think the difference there comes from exactly the point that we don't do topic, we don't do URL, we don't do like the concrete place where you put the event, you do contextual routing information, and they are both routing information, but in a different sense, or different scopes, I don't know. Yeah, that's actually one of the reasons why I, I, I try to pick up this, this PR from Thomas and see if I can work it. And I, that's one of the reasons it's, it's kind of on hold right now is because I feel like as you're saying, we, we actually do have to talk about routing information, but it's a different type of routing information. It's not necessarily transport level routing, if that's the right phrase for it. But I was, I was waiting until we finish up the discussion around ID, source, subject, and type, and those kind of things to, to see how that shakes out. And then I was going to revisit that one, because you're right. We do have to allow routing to some extent. But since we're waiting, the other interesting thing is Scott brought up the fact that he actually would like to include transport level routing information into the cloud event, not because he wants to use it for routing per se, but rather he wants to be able to pass that information along to the applications in a consistent format or in a consistent location. And since cloud event will be the, the thing that he's passing on to his applications, he was thinking, well, why not include it in there, right? Why include some other extra field just so I can pass along the HTTP headers as an example, But right? isn't that the wrong way around? You would give the URL when you are putting the event somewhere, not when you are taking the event from somewhere. Or maybe I'm thinking about this wrong, but when you need that information of where to put the event, you're putting it somewhere or you're fetching it from somewhere. So you must already have that information. So there's, you don't need to give it to an application that already has it. I think that maybe I'm saying this incorrectly. I think he's looking at the use case where you're a function author and your function signature, let's say it takes just a cloud event. That's the only thing it takes as input, right? The function may want to know, for example, what was the URL the client used to talk to me? Oh, okay. Yeah, now, right. now I get you. Yeah. And so he was thinking, well, if I'm already passing in this cloud event thing and it allows extensions, why not allow me to put the URL in there? And he could sure. technically, right? He, he can find an extension to do that if he wants to. He just didn't want to violate the spec because if the spec says don't put transport level information in there, he might feel like he's violating it, right? Sure, sure. I get that. The, the, I think the hard part is that there's no uniform way to represent that because it might be HTTP, it might be Kafka, it might be MQTT, it might be fucking anything. So Yeah, that's, that's a different issue. But yeah, I, I think he just wanted to make sure he wasn't violating the spec more than anything else. But anyway, different discussion. But why, why wouldn't that be an extension? I mean, sure. Yeah, you could. Yeah. He did, like I said, he, he, he could technically do anything he wants. He just didn't want to violate the spirit of the spec. And that, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So to the subject at hand, uh, KubeCon EU, um, hold on a minute, let me bring up the doc. I don't think anything's happened yet in there. In fact, I haven't even seen anybody open up issues or pull requests against the, um, against the white paper yet. So there's really nothing going on there. I haven't put up the templates for the presentations yet either. So for, for people to make edits, I haven't seen any discussions. So I don't think there's anything for us to discuss other than a lot of us have action items to do something in some space here. Um, so let me just open it up and say, does anybody have anything that they would like to bring up for a discussion point? Otherwise, 
this part of the meeting will end and we can switch over to the demo. I have a question. Um, yes, do we continue to present and help in this or not? I just wonder. Uh, say that again, Kathy, you broke up a little for me. Oh, okay. Do you need me to present or help and help with this, uh, with the presentation for the what's that? No, I, I, I think for the intro and deep dive, we already have people who have volunteered to present. For the serverless summit, I know you and I were talking offline, and if, our, if the proposal that this group put forward does get accepted, then yeah, I think you and I can talk on that one. Is that okay? Oh, okay. So for the summit one, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because okay. I know we, when you and I talked before, we were talking about how uh, Scott might have wanted to do a, a talk or wanted to join that talk for the serverless summit. Mm -hmm. But I, I talked to him offline, and because he's already talking at, I can't remember which one of these, he's already talking during the KubeCon sessions already. I talked mm -hmm. to him, and he's okay with, with you talking in his place for the serverless one. Okay, okay, okay. I see. So, so let me know what yep. you would like me to do. Um, because yep. I have another meeting. Uh, okay. Is that okay? Okay, yep, that's, that's great. I'll let you know when we need something. Okay, okay. 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 Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, any other questions or topics to bring up relative to KubeCon EU? All right. Then let's talk about demo. Um, I don't, oh, Doug, you are still on. Okay. So let me see here. I'm trying to figure out what, if anything, I should share. Did I, actually, I'll tell you what, let me stop sharing this. And Doug, let me try to find your latest doc that you may have sent me. Do, 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 do. Oh, crud. You know what's really weird, Doug? For some reason, when I open up your MP4 file, it keeps wanting to open up in open office as opposed to QuickTime. And I, for life me, cannot figure out why. It's very weird. Uh, Is it like a dot MP4? It's a dot MP4, yeah. Did, um, do you want me, I just uh, did an update to, to that document I sent you um, and I changed the word object oh. to subject. To okay, yeah. Yeah, if you want to share, that'd be great, because I can't see okay. the signer right now. Yeah, I'm not sure how much we have to talk about this call, but I did want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. And while Doug is bringing that up, um, uh, first of all, if you're not already in the Cloud Events demo Slack channel, um, please ping me and I'll invite you. It is a private channel, so it won't show up in your list, but you have to be invited. Um, my intern has agreed that he has time to, to look at this and he's already started. I'm hoping that maybe before the end of today, I'll be able to share with you guys the current version of what he has. It looks, it looks pretty good so far. Um, and then once we have that in place, um, we should be able to start getting people to hook up their functions to it. And then, so Doug, I can see your, your, your share now. So I'll let you go ahead and talk to whatever you have here. Right, so like I said in the call earlier, is I, I tried to put in a single document all the key discussion points that we've had about this and and then incorporate relevant tables from the those PowerPoint decks. Um, so I started out with just um, a, a narrative that was really intended to be um, almost attendee facing as an introduction to the demo. So um, you kind of can go through that and see if that makes sense from uh, uh, you know, the message to the attendees. Um, and then I went and started to go more into the specifications that, um, where it could be, uh, uh, you know, this document could be taken and then uh, work can be assessed and, and you could actually start coding. So you talked about uh, having somebody work on the dashboard. So, you know, the, uh, the whole display that, you know, the pro proposed display where it had the graphics, um, really could be looked at as a, um, as a grid, you know, where you're positioning uh, icons and uh, images and text uh, in just grid um, positions. So I kind of put together 
just a, a simple um, layout for for where the static images would be, um, uh, you know, based upon you know what the uh, the graphic that was in the deck. So anyway, it's a starting point, and then what the uh, so from there I've included a link to the uh, to the uh, uh, MP4 file you know the video that shows you know how all this animation actually um, or how the micro um, services would uh, um, generate events that would be um, uh, list, uh, reacted to by the dashboard app to turn on and off those dynamic images and text um, so then this section here I um, again I just put uh, this this is a table of uh, you call them microservices or processes that would be part of the dashboard app as it's listening into those uh, those cloud events that are coming into it um, that based upon so I, I wanted to back up on the on this thing the cloud this this uh, table that shows um, uh, the values of the attributes of the cloud events. It includes a source, an ID, a time, a type, a subject, and data. Um, this, I think, is a good example of uh, how to utilize those attributes, um, and how subject would be utilized, and how source would be utilized, and how ID would be unique to that source. So I think this kind of shows a, a, a good example of how um, all those attributes can come together to um, uh, to support this this um, orchestrated set of processes um, so this uh, the rules section here is is looking at what is in each of those attributes that is coming in looking at you know what's in the type attribute what's in the um, in the data elements or attribute which the data in, in these cases have attribute value pairs one or more that are associated with the subject which is an which is an object of type with the value of what's in the type right so in this case it's showing as attendees are connecting their devices that those uh, connections are manifest or represented uh, each as a cloud event and based upon the particular um, values of those attributes it's going to trigger um, particular actions okay and then each of those processes has an ID associated with it um, then you go into the retailer system, and these are the processes that would be implemented within that retailer system. Looking at the same, um, you know, for the same structured information that has the semantic identifiers in it. And then the actions that it's going to, those processes are, are going to take, implemented as microservices, as going to be uh, generating a new event, a new cloud event that represents uh, um, either a new object that was created or a, or a change in status of an object that it processed. And each of those process IDs would end up being um, part of the uh, the source attribute of the, of the cloud event it produced. Are you guys still there? Yes. yes. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. All right. So again, carrier system has a couple. Supplier system has one. Um, but if you implemented all of these services, it should support all the uh, the animation that was part of that that video. Um, there are some reference tables in addition that are 
need to be considered in addition to just the values within those cloud events. Um, that So there's the offerings table. So every um, cloud node would be participating uh, with a service, you know, in either the role of a supply, uh, retailer, carrier, or supplier. But it's your your roles are based, or sorry, the way you're going to take action is based upon your offering. And your offering could be a product or a service in this. And if you're a, uh, a retailer that is providing a you know, coffee drink, um, you're, you're going to have uh, um, a, a product that's like, you know, ID P1, P2, P3. And it's going to, you know, you can, uh, isolate the um, the events that you would take action on based upon a location that you're serving that you're serving within that airport exam um, environment so again this is how we can scale it from you know if there's only uh, four cloud event participants then you can scale it down but if there's up to I think this one includes 12 um, different um, participants each with a different service offering that's either going to be you know the the retailer product or it's going to be the inventory of this um, of the cups the supplies that feed into that fin that finished product or you're uh, offering as a service a uh, transport service which can be you know transporting as freight the uh, the, the replenishment of the the cups but you could also extend it into um, uh, being the flight that the passengers are going to be boarding. Right. Just, just let you know, but as of right now, because we have limited real estate for a demo, um, the current, the current plan that I have the intern working on is there, are, as you said, there are three basic roles that, that the cloud event working group participants could, could fill. One is they're a coffee shop. The second is they are a supplier of coffee cups, so they're like a warehouse. And then the third role is the transport between the warehouse and the coffee shop. And I figured between those three different roles, if we had you know, somewhere between three or four different people wanting to fill those various roles, that should be able to allow us to satisfy you know, 12 to 15 different, um, uh, you know, different cloud event participants playing in this in this game kind of a thing right so that, but if you process. had if if you had uh more than one uh retailer and you put in a copy order as as you know a passenger puts in his order you you have to um have a criteria that would only allow one of those retailers to fulfill that order and oh, that yes. could be we talked about that that could either be based upon the location that they're serving relative to where that person is located, um, you know, uh, or it could be based upon um, uh, the type of product, where it could be a small, medium, or large drink. Yep, exactly. Um, it, right, and, and, and so we had both location, we both talked about both location and, uh, you know, that size uh, matrix, but then, if you start getting into the carrier and what carrier is going <clears> to <throat> be selected to do the transport and what supplier is, it, it's hard to carry. It, you, you could certainly, you could do that to a certain extent um, by just focusing on size. But I think a, a location and the location that a carrier was servicing and a retailer was servicing it, it if you just stuck to the from and to location, it, it becomes more of a, uh, in my mind, a simpler model, but you can go either route. Yeah. You know, it, we talked that, about that. Yeah. yeah. And that's definitely something that, that we're taking into account. I think location was going to be one of the sort of the filtering criteria, that type of stuff. And I think size of the cup was going to be another filtering criteria. So depending on how many participants we have in there, we'll, we'll play with those variables, but yes, it, yeah. It, 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 so this play like, critical role. Yeah. So this table here really has to be um, configurable to where it could change, you know, even up to the last minute. And so you want to be able to not have this hard coded, but have this as a transportable table that 
could be um, uh, implemented with each of those cloud nodes and referenceable by those microservices. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I was, right. I, I was okay. definitely going to make the intern uh, make the UI uh, dynamic. So as as people join in the in the thing, it automatically adds icons or scales things out appropriately. So he has his work cut out for him. All right. Uh, see, there was a sort of comments. I thought. That's, Okay. Um, okay. So then, uh, so yeah, so this becomes a key uh, reference table for those microservices that needs to be transportable and distributed for, you know, last minute updates. Same thing with starting inventories, right? Each of those retailers is going to have initial stock to um, fulfill the drink orders. And then you have suppliers that have their starting stocks. And then when uh, those stocks are all um, depleted, um, then you could start generating those out of stock notifications. Um, it talks about each of those somewhere in those cloud service nodes, you have to be able to generate those events that reflect a new connection coming in. So that's just showing, you know, what, uh, what, uh, how to populate those attributes of the, the cloud events related to connections. Um, user interface for the attendees um, that's going to be able to able to generating generate originating objects that starts the orchestration so there's there's the orders um, and how, how an order would uh, be uh, represented as a cloud event so that's in here uh, I think that's it that's, yep. and so it, I think it's got uh, you know all the key elements to uh, as a, as a starting point, and then as you go through it and find out something may need to be adjusted uh, for some more simplicity or or whatever, but it, it's it's I think a good foundation. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jude, your hands up. Uh, yeah. In the middle, we were discussing um, that this table doesn't need to be hardcoded as such and make it more like dynamic, right? So, what if the participants, like the retailer, who wants to participate as a retailer or a supplier or a carrier, uh, they can advertise themselves to the airport, uh, which then dynamically updates the inventory and and then it's just reflected in the, the dashboard app. You were cutting out a little because there's some static, but I think you're asking whether. Yeah, I think I think Doug, there's a lot of static on your line or maybe you're moving something close to the microphone. Um, Jude, were you asking about whether the dashboard will be dynamic enough to allow people to join at the last minute? Yeah, so no, so uh, so we said that we don't want, want that, that mapping table to be static, right? We don't know hard code it anywhere. So, so right, we, which one are you talking about? You're talking about the, uh, the offerings? So, uh, yes, the offerings one, yeah, this one. Okay. Right, so this one, um, at runtime itself, we can have all the retailers, all the advertisers, sorry, all the suppliers and all the carriers advertise themselves yes. to the node. Like, you know, just broadcast, like, you know, a ping saying, hey, I'm Mike, Microsoft, I, I'll provide a latte to this location, and this is my class of um, beverage, right? And then the the airport node can dynamically generate this table basically at runtime. And then uh, the dashboard app can just look this up for a real time view of um, what kind of lattes are available. Do we have any chocolate drinks or, you know, and so on and so forth. Yes. That, that was my assumption as well. Yes. Okay. So everything, everything would be dynamic and to the point where if we don't get enough people registering for the proper roles, the demo won't work properly. Right. Because, no one will, for example, refill, the, a, you know, refill a, a coffee shop with the appropriate cups or sun, or whatever, right? If no one if no one registers to be a supplier, so you, you need a minimum of three, right? Exactly. A supplier, yeah. a, a retailer, and carrier, right? <laughs> exactly, right. Yep, and that's why there's there's part of me that thinks at some point we may need to, when somebody actually registers to the system, we may need to have to tell them what they can actually do in terms of, okay, they're registering as a supplier, but we may need them to support small cups instead of large cups, because if everybody registers for small, 
but we have coffee shops that are doing small and large, that's a problem, right? So they need to be a little bit of a negotiation during the registration process to, to make sure the demo is going to work properly, but we can work out those details later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, Jude, did, did you want to show your swim lanes to make sure everybody agrees with it and to make sure everybody's on the same page? Yes. Um, can I share my screen? Yeah, Doug, can you stop sharing so that Jude could take over? Okay. Okay, so hold on. Uh, do you guys see it? Yep, we see it. There are too many things blocking my view of my own screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, so um, I've, I've kind of divided this into two cases. So, we just take out two times an hour. So, this is a case one, right? So, this is from, a, from the view of a passenger. So, if the retailer has enough stock, uh, the passenger just orders using the, the dashboard app saying, that, dude, I want a coffee, X, Y, Z. And the retailer does a coffee minus minus to update its own inventory and then delivers a coffee. Right? That's, that's I think, is a direct simple use case, right? Yep. Okay. So then we can come to case two where the retailer has no stock because coffee minus minus has returned like, you know, less than uh, minimum stock, say either 10 or zero for that matter. So the retailer will then tell, tell the supplier that dude, I do not have coffee. And the supplier will then in turn uh, tell the carrier dude, uh, here's your coffee X and deliver to the retailer Y, which was here. And then an event from the carrier will go directly to the re retailer, which says, here's the order from the carrier. Yeah, I think in my mind, that's actually the, the way I think it is supposed to work based on our previous discussions. The only thing I would add to it, and it doesn't actually change anything other than um, it's not that the carrier sends an event to, that says, you know, here's your coffee, rather an event is sent when the carrier's truck arrives at the retailer. But it, that's a minor twist on it. Oh, of course. That, that's just playing with two states, right? Once yeah. the, when the carrier receives the, the demand for coffee and when the carrier actually delivers the coffee. Yep. Right? Yep. Right. And, and then you have case three, which I just thought of, uh, which we discussed just now, is the, um, the you know, broadcasting for initial... Uh, inventory. This, I'll just finish this off uh, maybe tonight and share a link with you guys in the evening. Yeah, I think that sounds good. I, th so, and I, think, that, that's, I think that's consistent with what we've talked about in the past. Yeah. So, okay. So, I'll try and get all the, all the events and the data from the table that uh, Doug has put in. I don't think I have a link to the latest one, though. Yeah, I, I was going to upload that later today. Yeah, so once I have that, I, I'll fill in all these cases with the actual contents of the event. And then we can just run through them, I think, on Monday. And, and I think we should just start imp implementing them or doing a POC or something like yeah, that. Yeah, um, like I said, my, my intern is actually kind of anxious because he feels like he's done enough on the UI to where he's ready to actually start receiving, a, a re starting to receive events. So later this evening, I was going to generate a dummy little function that would generate all the events that he needs to, to get the animation right. Once we feel like that's working well enough so that it's not embarrassing and it shows a general flow, then we'll open it up and you guys can all start generating events yourselves from your systems and we can start integrating it and see how well things work or don't work. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else people want to discuss? I think we, I think we're making some good progress here. Okay. Any questions, confusions, things that we're forgetting? Uh, we need to build like a, a presentation on like a short deck on what the demo is going to show. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, probably. Yes. Maybe just one or two slides or something. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. I figured that. I figure that's the easy part. <laughs> yeah, that is the easy. I'm just making sure that we're not like, you know, taking it for granted or forgotten about it. Yeah, yeah. We got it. We definitely have to have something. Good. All right. All right. Last last chance. Any questions, comments?
All right, cool. In that case, we'll sync back up again on Monday or uh, through the Cloud Event Demo Slack channel. So please keep an eye out for that because as things become available, I'll probably post information into that Slack channel. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you again on Monday. Thanks. Bye.